Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. I am excited to be in the seventh part of our Jesus League series. This is where we are looking at the writers of the New Testament portion of our Bibles, who they were and what they wrote. We started with the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are biographies of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. When we looked at Luke, we looked at Acts because Luke wrote Acts, a history of the early church. We then looked at Paul, who wrote 13 letters of the New Testament portion of our Bible to different people and churches. One of those people was Timothy, who we looked at last week week. When we looked at Timothy, we looked at two themes. Discipleship, very important, and giving things up for the sake of the gospel. A key text that we used for this was 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says, although I'm free from all people, I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews, so I can recruit Jews. I act like I'm under the law to those under the law, so I can recruit those who are under the law, though I myself am not under the law. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law, so I can recruit those outside the law, though I'm not outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ. I act weak to the weak, so I can recruit the weak. I have become all things to all people, so I could save some by all possible means." All the things I do are for the sake of the gospel, so I can be a partner with it. That's going to be the main point today. All things for the sake of the gospel. Now we arrive at Titus. I read Titus every day because I believe it to be the ultimate short field guide, quick reference guide to church leadership. It's a short book, easy read. Titus is one of the people in our Jesus League series who is not a primary author of any book of the Bible. But as we'll see, he's a really important leader. So we've included him in the Jesus League. Like that was my job to get him into the Jesus League. (laughs) Who is Titus? Let's take a look. Titus is like Timothy in many ways. He was a trusted student of Paul working with him for the sake of the gospel. He was also left in certain areas to take care of the churches there. We see in Paul's letter to Titus that there are many similarities to Timothy. Let's take a look at some of them. Titus 1, starting at verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. The reason I left you behind in Crete was to organize whatever needs to be done and to appoint elders in each city as I told you. Elders should be without fault. They should be faithful to their spouse and have faithful children who can't be accused of self-indulgence or rebelliousness. So there are some similar some similarities here to Timothy. So like the idea of being like a son to him, he left him to take care of some things and we see similar elder qualifications. We'll also see later that there is also an emphasis on sound teaching, like there was in Timothy, 1 Timothy. We see Titus mentioned in 2 Timothy, just that he's gone to Dalmatia. Titus was appointed as an overseer and church planter by Paul for good reason. He was a good leader. He sends him to Corinth. We're going to be looking at 1 and 2 Corinthians over this coming season. And we'll see that Corinth had a whole lot of issues. So Titus had to be pretty good to go take care of that church. So we see it in 2 Corinthians, starting at verse 16, 8, chapter 8, verse 16. But thank God who put the same commitment that I have for you in Titus's heart. Not only has he accepted our challenge, but he's on his way to see you voluntarily. And he's excited. We see that unlike Timothy... Paul didn't have Titus circumcised. Now, we've been dealing with Acts uh, 15 here and there. We're going to deal with it next week because we're going to talk about James, who was kind of the overseer there, Jesus' brother in Jerusalem. 
And so in Acts 15, we deal with a council. It's a very important council, a very important decision. Why? Well, when we look at the first part of Acts, like the first nine chapters or so, we see very few interactions between Jews and the Gentiles regarding this new way, later to be called Christianity. They are mostly all Jewish believers. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Right? So we talked about that a little bit. We touched on that topic. So naturally, this is what comes up. This question, well, wait a minute, if the Gentiles, all the non-Jewish people are to be brought in now, do they need to become Jewish first? So Paul, Barnabas, and Titus, they go to Jerusalem and they ask this question. There's a little debate about it. Finally, James, he makes the decision. He says, nope, they don't. A few other things that we'll look at next week. So this is the question that is answered. And Paul, he recalls this in Galatians, Galatians 2, starting at verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again with Barnabas, and I took Titus along also. I went there because of a revelation, and I laid out the gospel that I preached to the Gentiles for them. But I did it privately with the influential leaders to make sure that I wouldn't be working or that I hadn't worked for nothing. However, not even Titus, who was with me and who was a Greek, was required to be circumcised. Why? Well, he's probably dealing with more Gentile people. Whereas Titus, remember, he took them where the Jews were, so he could be all things. And Titus, or Timothy, had to give up a little bit. That's <laughs> how we saw. All right, we're not going to go there. <laughs> Let's look at Paul's letter to Titus. So as I said, it's a short letter. It's a three-chapter letter. It's a quick, quick read. <clears throat> Titus begins, well, Paul begins rather in his letter to Titus with the opening greetings. He moves very quickly, as we saw, into elder qualifications, things about sound teachings, warning against false teacher, te teachers. Then the bulk of this letter <clears throat> is really the center of the letter is about Christian behavior, how Christians should be behaving themselves. He says to you, Titus, work on your teaching. Older men, older women, younger women, wives, Slaves, he returns back to Titus, sound teaching. There's such an emphasis on good works, doing good deeds in this letter. I think it appears five or more times, the terms good works, that Paul needs to emphasize good theology, that we are not saved by good works. That's how heavy good works is weighted in Titus. So we get to the third chapter and we see this kind of poem of sorts, which is packed with some great theology. Titus 3, starting at verse 4. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out this Spirit on us abundantly or richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified or saved by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. So I said, this poem is packed with a lot of very important Christian theology. It should not be overlooked. We see the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, justification of being saved by grace, not by works, eternal life through Jesus and God's love for mankind. So this brings us to our theme, and this is what it is going to be. Don't slander the gospel. There is an emphasis on good works so that we as Christians don't slander the gospel. And the words used in Greek, which we'll look at just briefly, are actually very, very strong. They're stronger than that. Let's check it out. Titus 2, starting at verse 1 talking to Titus, but you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be level-headed, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not addicted to much wine. And they are to teach what is good, so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands, so that God's message will not be slandered. So here's where we're going to pull over the tour bus for a second. I'm going to digress just so we all get the point here because some will run with this and miss the point 
entirely. Let's hop on over to Peter, 1 Peter 3.1. Similar type of thing. Wives, likewise, submit to your own husbands. Do this so that even if some of them refuse to believe the word, they're not believers, they may be one without a word by their wives' way of life. After all, they will have observed the reverent and holy manner of your lives. What is the purpose here? It is to win people over to the gospel. In the same way, <clears throat> Paul said he would be a slave to win people over to the gospel. Here, Peter is calling for good behavior to win those husbands who are not Christians over to the gospel with good actions. Remember what Pastor Wayne said about being the only Bible some people might read. That's the point. Peter balances this out a little bit later. 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 7. Husbands, likewise, submit by living with your wife in ways that honor her, knowing that she is the weaker partner. Honor her all the more, as she is also a co-heir of the gracious life. Do this so that your prayers won't be hindered. Husbands are to submit as well and honor their wives. Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 5 that we should treat our wives as our own bodies. The overall point here is that we can be all things for the sake of the gospel. Both husbands and wives are to be kind, respectful, and submit so the gospel won't be slandered. This language is applied to all Christians in the same exact context and for the same purpose when it comes to honoring authorities. Titus 3.1, remind them to submit to rulers and authorities. They should be obedient and ready to do every good thing. They shouldn't speak disrespectfully about anyone. They should be peaceful, kind, and show complete courtesy towards someone, everyone. It is all about reaching people for the sake of the gospel. That is primary. So let's go back <clears throat> to that verse in Titus again. Titus 2, the end of verse 5. It is so that God's message will not be slandered. God's message can be slandered by wrong actions. The word here, and you know it in Greek, is actually blaspheme. It's quite strong. Right there in the Greek. So don't worry about that Lord of the Rings text there. But <clears throat> that not the word of God be blasphemed is literally what it says. So modern versions will change that word to slandered because a lot of people don't know what that means. But and I'm not going to digress again because of the beginners and I don't want to confuse you. But those of you who know your Bibles really well know that that word is connected to a very serious sin. So this is what Paul's writing here, okay? He has this kind of thing in mind. It's serious. So let's look at some other so that statements in Titus. Titus 2, 7. Offer yourself as a role model of good actions. Show integrity, seriousness, and a sound message that is above criticism when you teach so that any opponent will be ashamed because they won't find anything bad to say about us. Titus 2, starting at verse 9, tells slaves to submit to their own masters and please them in everything they do. They shouldn't talk back or steal. Instead, they should show that they are completely reliable in everything so that they might make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. So if you're confused here, there's some context about the slaves. Passages like this have been used in the past to justify things like slavery. But I hope you're understanding that that's not the context here. The context is no matter who you are, whether you're an older man, an older woman, a wife, a slave, a husband, whatever. He could have kept going on and on and on. The point is display courteous, dignified, Christ-like behavior for the sake of the gospel. We want our neighbors to just be like blown away, right? Why are these people so nice? We want them to think of us that way. That's what Paul wants. Good behavior is important because it makes us credible witnesses. When we behave 
badly, we are acting untrue to what we are saying we believe. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we learned that what we do says more about what we believe than anything we could possibly say. Titus 1.16, they claim to know God, but they deny God by the things that they do. They are detestable, disobedient, and disqualified for anything good. Good works are evidence of our salvation. So why good works? Again, so that we do not slander the gospel. The first thing, practically, that we need to do in the process of doing the good works that shows our neighbors that we love them is put ourselves in their shoes. I have used examples of Christians and their driving habits in the past. I like to use really practical examples that we're all guilty of. All right, so we got the Jesus fish on the back of our car, right? And then we just like cut somebody off because they're going too slow. Great, all right? But what about student drivers? What if we saw that on the back of the car? Would we give them a little more grace, right? I hope so. You guys are being quiet and it's scaring me. Let's go back to the beginning maybe, right? So what are the most important commands, everybody? <laughs> Don't, come on. Yes, right? I hope you would give them grace. Like, okay, they're new. At very least, I don't want to cause an accident, right? I might tailgate them. They might slam on their brakes. And we're going to get into an accident. When we know that someone is having an issue <clears throat> or that they're new, we tend to have more grace, more forgiveness, like the student driver. But what if we don't know what the person is going through? What if we have no idea? Wouldn't it help if we did? We're all going through something. All of us. No one's immune from that. What if the Holy Spirit would give us the eyes to see bumper stickers identifying people's problems? Imagine that. What if we saw this one? Would you lay on the horn? Would you tailgate this woman? Maybe she's driving her husband's car that she didn't used to drive a lot because they were traditional and he did all the driving. What about this one? Never lose a job? It's not always your fault. Sometimes you just get laid off. Maybe this person had big plans. Maybe they promised their kids a vacation or a bike or something like that. Maybe it's worse. Maybe they can't make the mortgage payment and they're looking at foreclosure. Can I tailgate that guy? Another scenario. Go back to. There we go. What about that one? I lost my dog recently. It's terrible. Maybe they're on their way to the vet to put the dog down. I had a friend whose father died of cancer. She drove him to the hospice his last day on earth. You know what he said to her? Slow down. Just wanted to take it in one last time. She told me there's a line of cars behind her. Do you think they would be honking at her if they knew where he was going? Go forward. Maybe this person just cut you off. Sped by you, cut you off. Those of you who know me, you know that a few years ago I had a TIA, basically like a minor stroke. Luckily, my wife was home. She drove me to the hospital. I'm sure she cut a lot of people off. I'm sure she broke a lot of traffic rules. Maybe that's the person in front of you. What about waiters or waitresses? This is another one that I like to use. Waiters and waitresses. Why? Because it's how we interact with our neighbors. I like to highlight situations that are difficult, right? Where we normally get ticked off. It's in traffic. <laughs> traffic is stressful anyway. I get it. I get angry too. Waiters and waitresses. You know, you want it to be right. When you're paying for the meal, I get it. <laughs> but what if 
instead of the name tag, what if what they were going through appeared on that name tag? What if the waitress who forgot your dessert, you looked at her name tag and it said, my boyfriend just broke up with me. Would you be mean about not getting the dessert? What if the waiter brought out your steak well done instead of rare? What if you looked at his name tag and said, my dad just died? Do we think that these people aren't going through anything like that? Would it change the way that we interact with them? Let's look at how this process works biblically. We're going to do James next week. So let's go to James, James 5, starting at verse 13. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church. And the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. We've seen that here, right? It works both ways. We aren't called to keep it secret. And this is hard because it calls for humility and honesty to say that four-letter word. Help. Remember what I read about opportunity from Galatians last week. In disclosing where you need help, you give your brothers and sisters in Christ the opportunity to help you. So we're going to try something today. And it's going to be optional. You don't all have to do it. It's fine. I get it. Fourth Sunday of every month, we celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion, as some of you know it. We do this on the fourth Sunday of every month after the service. There are a couple reasons for this. Some of you have to go. It would make the service really long. I get it. We want to be courteous of your time. Two, I think it deserves the greatest amount of reverence. This is where we are remembering and celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's huge. We should be reflecting on it, and we should understand what it is that we're doing. We learn in Corinthians, we're going to learn about that, that you should not take it lightly, very seriously, very reverently. I don't want to scare anyone. <laughs> That's not the point. Okay? Everyone's welcome, but you have to get it. You have to know what it is that we are doing. So we separate it out from the rest of the service. I do a small teaching. So today... We're going to do that, and everybody who wants to stay can come here. And that's fine. You're all welcome to stay. That's great. But I want to add a little something to it. I know a lot of you like to go out in the lobby, talk, and then come in. This week, I'm going to encourage you. I can't force you. I can, but I'm not going to. <coughs> to come on over here after the service. I can only go about five minutes without a joke. That was really heavy before. <laughs> so we're going to come on over here. That was from a Clint Eastwood movie, wasn't it? <laughs> wah, wah, wah. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to come on over here. You just gave me more material, man. Uh, <laughs> and pray. Get serious again. Hold on. Pray. I want you to think about something. <clears throat> there's going to be the communion table there, somewhere thereabouts, with the elements. There's going to be name tags. We have name tags. I want you to pray about what you're going through. And put it on the name tag. I'll start. So I made a really big mistake last week, and I talked about how tough it is to be a pastor. I'll probably never do that again, <laughs> because like everything on the list of things that I went through happened last week. It was awesome. It was just wonderful. <clears throat> there was death. There was criticism. All kinds of things. I had one day where it was just eight hours of nonstop meetings. I literally had my head spinning. It was literally spinning. I've never had that happen before. I got to Bible study on Wednesday. And I was just like, this should be Saturday. I couldn't concentrate. I was not myself at Bible study. 
I couldn't believe it. I've never had that many meetings in that short of a time, that many problems in that short of a time. Here's what happens when that goes on. You begin to worry. Little things start to stress you out. You become anxious. So what did I do? I ask some people that I trust and love, pray for me. Please pray for me. They got it. Yes, we will. They get it. They know. So I worry a lot. I worry about the church. <laughs> I worry about you guys. I worry about my kid. I worry about my wife. And when I have weeks like this, it begins to rise. But you know what? I'm okay. I received prayer and it accomplished much. I'm here. I'm calm. <laughs> I hope I'm not freaking out on you guys. I feel okay. I could still use some prayer. <laughs> so I'll start. I don't want to make it awkward for anyone. But look, I know you're going through stuff. We try to hide it, right? That's what we do. We put a little Christian faces on and everything's fine. It's not. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to say it's not. So I want to make something really, really clear. And this is really important. This is not saying that we identify with what is going on, right? So you may put a sin on here. You may put something, you know, that you want to give up or that you're doing or you're just tired of. It's just this endless cycle and you're in a rut. You just want to take the mask off and say, I'm done. Pray for me. That's fine. But it says, hello, my name is because it's a generic name tag. It's not that we're identifying in that sin. Understood? It's just that this is what is coming through from my heart. This is what's on my heart. This is what I'm going through. Pray for me. So we can just sit, put the name tag on. When you come in for communion, just simply look at the person next to you, look at their name tag and pray for them. That's all. If you're not going through anything, then don't put a name tag on. Just come in and pray for people. That's fine too. It's not complicated. Our prayers shouldn't be lofty all these big words and all this stuff. No, 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 no. Just talk to the person. Talk to God. That's it. It's as simple as that. What's on your heart? What do you see when you see what's on that person's heart? That's all it is. It's about relationship this way and that way. That's Christianity. We're just filled with God's love so that we can give it. It's really that easy, guys. It's not about putting on a show in your prayers or with how you feel. It's okay. I understand that this can be difficult. So I'm just encouraging. That's all. You don't have to do it. It's all right. But I want to give that opportunity. If you're like me and you're having a bad week, and you need prayer, don't be afraid to ask for it. I'm the pastor. I'm not afraid to ask for it. I need prayer too. Nobody's above it. This is both an exercise of taking off the mask and giving others the opportunity to pray for you. We are called to love one another. We're called to forgive one another. We are called to pray for one another. And when in doubt about someone's circumstances, we are always to err on the side of grace. It is grace we have been given and grace we are indebted to give. Amen? Love you guys.